Welcome to the Sensitive Solpreneur Podcast. I am your host, Esther Sibrana Zarias, and I am a reminder of the star within you. While reading astrological charts, I'm holding the frequency for you to align with your own star. There is nothing missing in you that you have to get from another. They can only reflect where you are. By giving myself permission to stop blocking the love that I am, exploding within me in such a way I cannot contain it anymore, since I was awakened for this heaven on earth mission. I am creating a ripple effect for you and for anyone in my field to awaken that love within to and spread it. So you live your dreams now, star, not any other projection, encouraging others to do the same. You have the gift of empathy and high sensitivity, and you are awakening to infinite love, because that's what you are made of, where you come from and where you are returning to. Nothing you have to do to earn that heaven of being who you are, except for letting it in, giving yourself permission to break free of everything that tells you otherwise. All distorted mind programming is falling apart in that process. We have been pioneering for a time when we would be fully ready for this kind of love. And this time is now. We are here by the millions, volunteering to shift with our consciousness closer and closer to our forgotten truth. That's my dream. A million stars awakening. What's yours? Wake up, star, and shine your love. Grant yourself heaven within and bring it up. We are a whole ocean waving, and every drop of it counts. In this podcast, I'm having conversations and joining forces with other sensitive solopreneurs and new world leaders, volunteering for this time of awakening who we truly are. Hello, stars. Welcome to the first episode of the Sensitive Solpreneur podcast. I am so excited to share my first guest, Rachel Strivelli. Rachel is a psychic, intuitive coach and author of Talk to the Trees. She helps overwhelmed spiritual entrepreneurs to gain clarity, feel grounded and to take a line at action. A former teacher and organic gardener, she brings her knowledge of patterns of nature and working with your strengths to help her clients feel expansive keep their momentum going and achieve their potential. She has been published on Thrive Global, Tiny Buddha, Scary Mommy, Positively Positive, and has been a future guest in podcasts and summits. Okay, so here's Esther Sibrano from Awakening with the Stars. We are with Rachel Trivedi. I think I'm pronouncing it well. Yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> from Soul Pioneer, and uh, she just launched Talk to the Trees, which is her new book, yes, and I'm very excited to be doing this interview, it's the first interview of the podcast, the Sensitive Solpreneur podcast, and and yeah, I feel like I was reading this morning Talk to, Talk to the Trees, surrounded by pine trees, and I was just telling you how beautiful it was, because like I can really feel the energy of a book that is directly channeled from the trees. And this is something that I really wanted to, to share with more people. And yeah, but first of all, I would like to ask you a little bit, like, how did you discover your psychic abilities? And mm -hmm. how did you get into this world? Yes, thanks. So when I was younger, a child, I had some of these abilities and I didn't really... Some of the time I just thought, well, this is just natural. Anyone could do this maybe. And some of the time my psychic abilities would freak me out because I would see spirits and I wasn't expecting to see them. And so it was a, a, a bit of the yin and the yang of some of it just felt really natural and easy and, and, and my intuition would speak to me. And then other times it would be feel alarming and overwhelming. And, you know, even as an adult, that sometimes happens too. <laughs> so <laughs> as a child, at one point, it 
it got so where it felt more overwhelming than not. And so I just prayed to have my gifts taken away until I could handle them better as an adult. Um, and I read enough fairy tales and things like that to know you don't have to ask for something to go away forever because who knows you might want it. And if it's a gift, if it's a natural talent, uh, just because you're young and don't know how to handle it doesn't mean you won't know later. So I had that impression of at some point I might want this in my life, but right now it feels an inconvenience and it freaks me out. And so, so just like that, my gift went away pretty much overnight. And the only way that it was obvious that it was still there was I would have dreams that sometimes would foreshadow events or that would give me clues about situations and people. And all my life, I felt very intuitive, but I didn't really attach or connect with the idea of a psychic. And and some of the time I even forgot about how I used to see spirits and and feel the the animals that we had that it, it was like they were talking in my head to me not all of the time not constant conversation but that they would communicate with me at times and even if they passed away because we lived right near busy road so sometimes our animals would get hit by a car or something else would happen so we didn't always have the pets for that long but then they would sometimes I would see their spirits after they had passed and they would visit and so for me all of that felt very natural and normal but it but I also had periods where it just wasn't even a part of my daily life anymore. And I was just living a regular life, you know, whatever, whatever you might call that. And then over the last number of years, I kept on returning more and more to my intuition and to my spiritual connection. And, and largely because I've always been really connected to the earth and and felt such a deep love for plants and insects and animals, all the organisms. And so for many years of my life, I was working as a science teacher or in environmental education, and I was working to try to figure out how to help people care for the earth more. And the deeper that I went into this, both with my own curiosity and my own desire for where is this going to go, it, it led me back to this psychic path and this spiritual path because, well, well, first I was an organic garden coach because to me, organic gardening is an area where, or organic agriculture in general, it intersects a lot of aspects of life in terms of your health, the environmental health and, and social justice and all of these things. So I thought this is an area where if I work in it and learn in it, I'm helping impact a lot of things. And so I was coaching individuals how to grow their organic gardens. And over time, my intuition just kept on speaking up more and more saying, you need to work with people more than just in their gardens. This is bigger than this. This is broader than this. And for about a year, I just ignored that intuition and was like, never mind, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> and and then I thought, okay, it, this won't go away. This keeps on talking to me. So why don't I try it out? So then I started life coaching and helping people, mostly women, with empowerment, owning their power, speaking their their truth, living a more intentional life. And after a few years of doing that part time, what I realized is time and time again, people kept on telling me how intuitive I was and how much that was the thing that was helping them time and time again from our times together. And so that combined with the pandemic and having a child, a small child who was having a lot of sleep issues and behavior and emotional turmoil, and I couldn't find a way to help him led me deeply back into psychic abilities and my spiritual path. And then as soon as I decided, okay, I'm going to own this, then it was, it was like everything opened back up again for me. Although I will say, I don't, I still don't see spirits. That gift has not come back. And honestly, I don't really mind because as I said, when I was a child, it felt intrusive. They were just always practically like popping up all over the place. And I'm like, I'm just trying to walk through my house. Okay. Like I don't need spirits like popping up out of nowhere. And, you know, maybe there's some people who that that would be fine with them. But for me, I like a little bit more of a calm, cool, expected experience. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah yeah oh what a story because <laughs> in a way you you have been all your life connected to this so you, mm -hmm. you're talking like since you were a kid and yeah you kind of shut it down and then you kept opening to it again and again mm -hmm. so it's been like a muscle also right like yes. opening up and in that sense i honor you because it takes a lot of courage to open to this and and to to expose it as well to to be busy mm -hmm. but it yes and yeah and i'm very curious as well because um because i also had like um i had like an awakening i i didn't have so much connection with with all of this when i was a kid Although I do, I did have a lot of, you know, nightmares and things like mm. that. And, and I knew something was going on, but nobody could tell me about it. So I kind mm -hmm. of ignored it also. And, and it was more like in university that I opened, something happened there. I started seeing auras and things like that, having more psychic dreams and so on. But I wasn't ready either. So I also put yeah. it down. And and it was more recently that um, I couldn't ignore it anymore. It was like mm. <laughs> too obvious to ignore. I love and that. Yeah, yeah. There was definitely a, a calling, and and I feel that people who do this kind of work, um, yeah, it takes a process to to be okay with it, to be open about it, and and that's another thing I wanted to talk about because um around one of the things that really stand out for me when reading talk to the seeds is the uh, how much they help us with self confidence and with the wound of maybe those of us who felt like outsiders or who mm. didn't fit in into the mm -hmm. normal and, mm -hmm. and until now it was like a curse somehow but it's starting to be more and more like at least for me like realizing this is not a cure at all this is a gift and, yeah and we were not supposed to fit in because we are here to create a new paradigm right so yes yeah like that's the best part right but until you are at this point uh yeah sometimes it, it can be also full of challenges and yeah, my, my question about that is that, uh, how did you start talking to the three? Mm, yeah, good question. Well, I, mo throughout most of my life, in my hardest moments, it also felt like there weren't always people right there who could help me. Uh, and, and so, or even if the people were there, they couldn't help me in the way that I needed help. And so I'm thinking there, there are many points of when I was in high school and I would get in fights with my parents or in, in my early twenties of navigating breakups or new relationships or moving places. And there was one summer I worked on a farm in New Hampshire and I was dating somebody who lived in Massachusetts, one state away. And I thought I would be seeing him more, but I didn't hardly, we only saw each other on the weekends and I was doing this farm job, which was quite physically taxing Monday through Saturday. So six days a week I was working and then maybe a day and a half, I would get to see the guy that I was dating. And the farmer that I worked with was very quiet. We were in a small town on a farm. It's pretty much plants and insects in the <laughs> sky and whoever else works on the farm. It's, it wasn't a busy place. And so I, I had what I felt was this aching loneliness, but I also kept returning to I'm surrounded by this beautiful nature, these beautiful plants, everything is so vibrant and alive. And so I really started tuning into, can I connect deeper to to where I am to help this feeling of loneliness because I knew like I said I, I had six days of just me and the silent farmer and I don't even know if we spoke 10 sentences to each other all day and sometimes I would work in one place and he would go work far away so even if we were near each other whether or not we were near each other we weren't talking for most of the day so it was a lot of time with the plant and the soil and my thoughts and, and 
So, and it wasn't like it clicked automatically. Like I kept on that summer pondering and exploring, how can I have a relationship that feels connected in my heart that fills a need for connection. And then several years later, when my one of my grandparents died, one of my last remaining grandparents, I was living in Canada, and I had almost no friends because I had just moved there with my boyfriend. And I felt very lonely. And I had just lost someone who was so important to me. And I would, it was fall. So I would go sit under the trees at the campus where I was studying grad school. And I would just sit with the trees and sit with my feelings of grief and loss. And I would look at the trees and I would think, okay, they're dropping their leaves. Like loss is a part of life. It's a part of this cycle of life. And it would give me the strength to, to not just stay mired and stuck in the grief and the loss, but it helped me to move through it. And I don't remember, I was at some point seeing a counselor, but honestly, and I value counselors very much, but at that point in my life and at certain other points, the counselor couldn't do what the tree did for me. The tree was Mm -hmm. by being there with the tree, it was able to help me come to my own conclusions and deal with my own feelings and emotional process so that I could feel that calm connection grounded And one of the things that I always feel from the trees that I'm glad you connect to in the book is this sense of belonging and connection and you're going to be okay. And for humans, we put one foot in front of the other. The trees, they don't have their feet to put in front of the other, but it, um, I, I often on throughout my life, I just find sometimes as much as I love people for some of the aches in my soul or life's heartaches or problems of the world that upset me, people can't help me to process those feelings, to process the pain and the emotions. But if I go sit with a tree or a shrub or in a garden and I sit there and usually I sometimes also have something to write with, I can feel better about it all. And so I have just found for me that in my lowest points, that is what gives me that connection that renews the hope in me that gives me that resilience of you can take a deep breath and realize this is all part of the cycle of life or whatever other big idea I get in that day. And uh, even though, so the, the book is called talk to the trees. When I am interacting with them, it's not, it might not look like a conversation to somebody else. So I'm not actually yes. literally talking out loud. That was actually and my I, my question. You can yeah. my mind. <laughs> oh, cool. And I <laughs> don't I, I was necess- going to ask you, yeah. The, like yeah. the way maybe it's not through words, right? Right. And it's funny because my daughter was asking me the other day about, well, what language do they have, mom? And, and, and more details. And I've met people who, when they interact with plants, it literally is like a conversation in their head. Mm -hmm. For me, and this is a lot how my psychic abilities show up too. It's less of a conversation and more of a just knowing. And it's almost, to me, it feels like an awakening of, in my mind of, oh, all of a sudden there's an idea that kind of unfolds or blossoms and I see it and I get it. And then I think, okay. And so when I'm having challenging moments, I'll go sit outside in my, around my house, I have some lovely trees or I'll go for a walk and I will think about whatever my problem is or the thing that's upsetting me that I want insight on. And then I just take a deep breath. And similar to meditation, I try to clear my mind and be open. And then I just walk around and look at the trees. And or if I'm sitting, I just sit there and I look at the trees. And then within a few moments, it's like this idea starts like blooming in my mind. (laughs) And, and, you know, someone might say, well, maybe that's God or spirit or your higher self or whatever. And who knows, maybe it is. But to me, a lot of times, if I'm going out there looking at the trees, that's who I feel like I'm talking to. Right. And my, my thought with the book is it it could look different for everyone because Mm -hmm. we're all different. And some people 
like I said, I've known some people who they say it's like a conversation in their head, literally that's happening. Or some people, when I was a child, I would probably just go and literally chat to the trees out loud with my mouth. And I mean, the my garden plants, I do talk to them in my garden and tell them they're cute or they look good or <laughs> those things. So sometimes I will talk out loud, but it doesn't have to be a conversation with words. An artist might want to draw or paint a tree and that might be their way of interacting. Yeah. And you would say it's like a process. It, is it, it has been a process for you. Maybe in the beginning you just yes. sit there. And, yes. And maybe eventually you start getting some information. Maybe for a person it's a, an image or, or, or a word or something, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think it is a process. And like, like you said, it could be an image, it could be a word. For me, a lot of time, it's a feeling or I just have the knowing that is there. And it, similar to channeling or some other, or, or having intuition, which I think we all do have intuition to a degree or another, it's a matter of developing it. Part of it is trusting in, if you feel that you receive a helpful message or an image then trusting the validity of that and allowing yourself to receive that. Yeah, because it's like more like the right brain, right? It's not supposed to be like step one, step two. Yes. It's another way of receiving information. And that doesn't mean it's not valid. It's just another way. Mm -hmm. and also it, right? Yes, exactly. And so to me, the trees seem very wise. And the other thing I'll say is whenever I'm interacting with nature, I always remember that I need to have patience when connecting with them, connecting with it, because I, that's the other thing I feel as humans, we're a little bit fast paced and go, go, go and phones dinging and things pinging and ah, notifications and whatever. Like, it just feels like there's a lot of flurry and activity. And if you look at a tree, unless it's the middle of a storm and it's swaying around, it, there's not visually a lot of activity that we see going on. And so I, I think it, it's if I went to a calm, quiet, wise elder person and I asked them a question, I have to be patient to listen for the answer and work with what their timing is and their speed. They might not spout out an answer five seconds after I ask. And so allowing there to be some time to either in that moment or over the course of a week of getting to know another being and allowing it to express itself in the way that it does best. And that might be slower or different than you or I talking. Right. And so who is this talk to the trees for? Mm. Yeah, good question. I picture that it's for several types of people. So one, someone like myself or you who you're sensitive, you care about a lot of things. And sometimes that caring could feel like a burden or a curse or like it's a lot to handle. So tapping into that stability and groundedness and confidence and resilience that the trees have that that's I think it's good for people in in that type of who are just wired that way empaths and sensitives I also think it's good for if you know in your life that there's a lot going on and you would like to invite more mindfulness or spirituality or connection into your life but you also feel that your life is rather busy or packed full of things because the chapters in the book are very short. And I, my logical mind, my wanted to write a longer book. But when I talked to the trees about it, they were very clear that this was to be a very short book. And I had a lot of discomfort about that because I kept on thinking, well, how is this going to be valuable if this isn't longer? Or how can I put out a book that it's it, the book is longer than they even wanted it to be. And mm -hmm. at a certain point, I'm like, I, I'm writing this book. So it's going to be this long. <laughs> um, but but as I was finishing, I started realizing I see the wisdom in it doesn't have to have lots of length to be useful. And a busy person is probably going to benefit from, oh, I, they can just read a half a page or a chapter, which is three pages, and in three pages, shift their perspective 
feel better, uh, raise their vibration, however you want to put it in a short period of time. And that's the value of it's not this book, I don't believe is intimidating. It's very inviting in that you can open it to any page and read it to tap into a morsel of, okay, now I'm inviting in this, this stability, this groundedness, this calm. And so it's, it's for both people who have a half an hour to go sit out with the trees and meditate and do whatever you want to do or a long walk and who want to have a more lengthy experience. But it's also for if you just need to pop in for 30 seconds in between doing something else as a way of reconnecting yourself to a moment of groundedness and some, some wisdom and calmness from the trees. Yeah, that's so beautiful because um, also I feel like um, I'm very sensitive to books and even if they are in the Kindle, I can feel the, the energy. And this book, I can totally validate what you said because it's like you open it and you can feel that calm. And I oh. actually like it to read it next to a tree because then the, the effect is even more. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, even if you are not next to the tree, it's like you bring that energy into your life somehow. And mm -hmm. it's it's great also that it's very easy to read. It's very short. Uh, and I also love that each chapter has a, an exercise to it. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes super practical. Yes. And it's very easy also to come back to it. Like maybe one chapter that resonated with you, you can repeat. And... Yeah, I yes. love it. <laughs> oh, thank you. And here's another thing I wanted to share that yeah. feels exciting to me is I have heard several people tell me they've been reading it to their children and I didn't picture it as a children's book. I, I see it could work for children. Yes, but it has been such a delight to hear these these moms who contact me and say I read this with my child and then the next day we went and climbed trees or we read this chapter and we really connected with this that maybe there's a tree that's that's like you you go out in the woods and find a tree that feels like oh that tree and I have this in common <laughs> and so that's been the other delight for me is hearing that it's a book that is a is a way to engage children with with feeling connected to the trees, connected to the planet, and also perhaps get into some other character qualities that are that are good for anyone to develop. Yeah, I wish I I had this book like when I was a child, and yeah, <laughs> and also that it, it's beautiful that you can also share it with with children, like you can read it together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another thing I wanted to ask you is that can a, a specific tree have a message for you mm. or you could talk like to any tree? Because you said maybe there's one that resonates more with you. Right. I think that totally depends on the individual. And I know that sometimes I will be walking somewhere and I'll see a tree and I think I have to go talk to that tree. And, and I might even say that to someone, which again, it doesn't mean that every time I go up and I'm like, blah, 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 to the tree, I just <laughs> go. And if I can, I touch the bark and just look at it and admire it and be in its presence for a moment or two. And it makes me think of how people are too. You could walk into uh, an event, let's say that you're going to, or, or, or a lobby where there's a lot of people and sometimes there's one person that just calls to you more than another person. And maybe it's the outfit they're wearing or the way they carry themselves, or maybe they're wearing a hat of the same sports team you like, or jewelry that's your favorite stone that they're wearing. And so that is a natural connection point that draws you to that person. And so when I feel that way about a tree that I'll see, I just follow that connection. If I want to go for me, it's I like to put my hands on it and just be admiring of it. And and there are some in some cities and towns, there are trees that are very old or have plaques written about them that lots of people can connect to. And then I think it might also be I've known many people who say, oh, when I was a child, there was this one tree that was really special to me. When I was in college, one of my college friends 
had this great connection to a sycamore tree that was in the botanical gardens near my college. And for me, it's more of a general experience of, I, I like a lot of the trees and sometimes one or two will call to me more, but I think it, it can be a choose your own adventure of however it feels best and easiest. So if you live somewhere where there's a tree on the property where you live or that you're going to pass by every day, I would say start connecting to that tree. See right. if you can notice things about it and yeah. connect to it in whatever way. Maybe you just look at it. Maybe you draw it. Maybe you take out a journal and you write, what does the tree want to tell me? And then you pause and let yourself see if the tree has any messages for you. Maybe you take photographs of it. Um, so trees that are in your proximity is a good place to start. Or maybe you have a park or a special nature area somewhere nearby that you go to and you just wander around till you notice where's the place that I feel the most drawn to be in. And and because I think too, similar to what I said about spotting a person in a crowd and feeling connected to them, some of this is listening to your own inclinations, the own what's pulling you towards your curiosity or your connection. And it makes me, when I met you, I thought, oh, I like you instantly. <laughs> Sometimes it's like, right. you could explain it probably, <laughs> or you can just notice it and go with it. And, and same with trees, ginkgo trees. If there's a ginkgo tree, I love it. And, and I feel <laughs> that way about maple yeah. trees too. I love them. Yeah. So it's, if it's there, I'm just going to go to it and admire it and pick up the leaves and and so noticing what your own inclination is and your own first point of connection, I think is always a good leading uh, approach to help you figure out, well, you know, do I connect to this one or that one? And just watching and and observing how it goes as you follow that inclination. Yeah, because also it sounds like a, an allowance, right? Like giving yourself yes. permission. And, and like a game, right? Yes. Uh, gonna try to play this game. Let's see how it goes. Yes. And that makes me think. Like, yeah, yeah, tell me. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to say, when you say it's a game, it sounds even more fun. It makes me think, I want to yeah. go to a town <laughs> yeah. I haven't been to and just be like, let me see how many trees I find that I like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's no right or wrong. You just yes. go with, it with how you feel it. And there's probably yes. a reason because like, like you say, like, when when you reach out that day in that in that group, uh, it was like, oh yeah, we have something in common, right? Uh, yes. But then we started talking, and it turns out we almost have the same birthday, and, and yes. you know, and we all have <laughs> these psychic abilities and so on, and so, and and then you you know you start pulling, and and it turns out that it makes sense, right? That you felt that inclination and not another. Yes. One. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and then I. I'm going to share like how I started connecting with the trees because yes. I um, I was looking for a place for my moon ritual that I guide every month and I was out there and trying to find I don't know a beautiful place or something and this tree caught my attention and then it was like so, clues one clue after the other because then suddenly I saw in Gaia TV I saw a documentary about how to create a template I, mm. a, tem a temple, a light temple. Yes. And then I created the light temple around this tree. And and then I started doing the ritual there. And and then one day I was listening to, new, listening to an interview and someone was saying like, um, there was a tree who had a message for her, something like that. And and then suddenly like, uh, like something popped up in my mind, like saying, oh, maybe that tree also has a message for me. I'm going to try, you know? And then yeah. the next time I went, I was like, do you have a message for me? <laughs> and then I started feeling this energy that Ooh. felt that it meant that I had to sit on the tree because it's a big tree. You you can actually sit in there. And then Ooh, I, I nice. sit in there and suddenly I start feeling this energy because, uh, and then I remembered that I used to go to a massagist and he would also check my chakras if they are open or closed, right? And And then my... I also had um, like my lower chakras open would be closed. 
mm. and like a protection mechanism and then like i used to go there and then he would like open them but i haven't been i haven't been there for a while and then the tea was like i was feeling like he was telling me okay now anytime you want you can come here and i can open them for you oh my gosh <laughs> i, I love that this energy you know through my body and this groundedness also and yeah it was it was very really special mm. that's why i just had the conversation <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Well, and I love maybe the listeners already know this, but when we think of something or have a memory, even if it seems random, I don't think it's random. The tree was making this connection for you of an experience and then letting you have that feeling. And oh, that's just so beautiful. Yeah. 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 And then now I moved to Ibiza and I was kind of sad. Like I, I went there and I said bye to the tree. <laughs> But yeah. then you also talk about how there is this like connection. Like, is it true that all trees in the world are connected? You know, I don't know how it works across continents because they might not be connected that way. But yeah. the more so when I was in grad school, I studied soil science and I learned about in the root system, the trees connect and they also connect with fungi, mushrooms, and they send messages and communicate with each other. I don't know if they're all connected, but I wouldn't be surprised. And this, I think, relates to the first seed for me that was planted about this book, uh, because I knew I wanted to write a book, but I was going to, I was thinking about writing something different. And then I was online and I saw these videos of people talking to trees near where they wanted to live. And it was a, a little ritual of you go they were, the woman was looking at an apartment she wanted to rent. So she went and told the tree, I want to live here. Can, can you help, you know, do some magic for me so I can get this apartment. (laughs) And, um, and she got the apartment. So yeah. (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And, and then I saw other people were doing this and it was making me feel so tickled because I thought it's children wouldn't question talking to a tree or asking a favor of a tree. Hey, can you do this for me? But sometimes adults, think things like that are silly or how does this work but the trees they're connected through their root systems and their energetic fields and I think if you know about quantum physics and infinite field of possibilities and all that to me it seems like they are a very natural teacher or connection point for us to connect to here's a literal living creature that operates via all of these connections, many of which are unseen because they're under the ground. And so if, if you want to lean in heavily to the magical manifesting mystical side, then, then yeah, you could, you know, talk to the tree, ask it to send a message to the one in the other place, perhaps, or ask it, Uh, there's a book I read many years ago where the woman was talking about you ask a tree to help find an answer that you need. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I I didn't, I don't think I put that in the book. If I did, I don't remember, but I like the idea of asking a tree to help you find out information because they have this whole network that they can communicate with trees in other places. Whoa. Like now, now, like I'm connecting things because (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because I like I I had been building this relationship with this tree for for years, and then uh, now that I moved here, it's actually really difficult to find a place in Ibiza. But in my mm. case, it was like the first place I saw. I knew it was that one, and then when I got here, like this tree that is my friend <laughs> back in the in Catalonia, uh, he's a pine tree. And then oh, this yeah. house is surrounded by pine trees. So oh I felt, my gosh. I, I feel like I love there is a connection, you know? Like yes. It brought me here. <laughs> yeah. Mm, that's so beautiful. Yes. Yeah. So it's very interesting, this connection with manifestation. I didn't think about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's still an area that I'm exploring. So I can't speak a lot to. I mean, I've I've been... I've used manifesting in other ways with nature, but this area is a growing edge for me. And so I don't have a lot to say, but I also feel for probably a lot of people and like all the listeners take what you like and go explore and come back to us. And one of my (laughs) plans actually is that this is the first of 
a series of maybe two books. I don't know if there will be a third, but mm -hmm. my plan is that the second book will be other people's experiences of talking with the trees or here's what happened or heck, it sounds like there should be a whole section on manifesting with trees <laughs> because I know I, similar to the trees, it it's not that you that I have to do everything by myself or you have to do everything. Like mm -hmm. we can work together and, and all of our knowledge. That's what we've been doing for a lot of humanity is we take knowledge and we yeah. build on it. And so this, this idea of manifesting with the trees and, or talking to the trees and asking them to talk to other trees, retrieve information perhaps, or send out messages yeah. or, a lot of people I see online also talk about trees can be like a guardian for your, your house of the, yeah. like protecting you. And so I think there's a lot of different areas to explore. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing. I, I feel super safe here because of this, you know, they are surrounding the house somehow. Yeah. Yes. I love Ooh, that that's too. so good. Yeah. And I love the idea for the second book and how you say like, that we are actually creating this new paradigm, this new earth. Yes. And yeah, and we can create it the way we, we would like it to be, right? So, mm -hmm. and and it's not supposed to take a, a big effort because we are this, like the trees, we are also connecting each other, right? And and it, yes. gets, it gets to be easier. It gets to yes. be right. And that's another thing you talk about in the book, how they actually give us an example of how it is, you know, to be connected to nature and have everything you need available mm -hmm. like the sun and the what you talk about the photosynthesis would you like to yes. a little bit on that yeah that was one of my favorite chapters because every time I read it I think I could read this every day probably <laughs> and that it really surprised me so the trees one of the other big ideas that they share is this one way I guess to put it is trust in that whatever you need is going to be available to you or you will receive it. And there's religious texts that have that in them too, mm -hmm. about receiving and um, all your needs being met. And, and I also think the way the trees express it is because they, because they can't move, they're rooted in place. Everything that they need in a way has to come to them. And so they get to let the sunshine fall on them and make it into food. And one of the lines from the book that I really liked is that light particles are love particles. And so whenever I read that chapter and probably for the rest of the day today, <laughs> because I'm talking about it, I like to think about, so the sunlight falling on me is, is like love. I'm being bathed in love and support and, and I'm able to receive everything I need and I can accept it all. And, I think the more that any of us calibrate to feeling that, the more it lets your energy system allow those things in, the more it reminds us, okay, if that's true for the trees, maybe it can be true for me. Maybe it can be true for you and, and letting that in. And it also, to me, there's a gentleness about the way that the trees talk that feels very easy to relax and and let let the love in yeah yeah and to integrate it with our human life because mm -hmm. uh, another thing that i love that you say in the book like how they have the maybe the scars from lightning and actually yes. I, I had some difficult days uh, last week maybe also because of the uh, chiron in areas with yes. the jupiter like uh -huh. we, we could feel the last days like the wound of identity mm -hmm. and Today I was there and it was very healing because reading the book, being with the trees, like I felt like this grounding me and and this calm, like like everything is okay. And and then maybe you come back to your life and even if there are some challenges, you you feel like again connected to your true nature, right? And, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think you're right, and I think. I'm glad you brought that up because one of the other things that I find that happens with time and nature is the trees and other organisms, they're so true to themselves and to their true nature that it helps me to calibrate and get back to what I feel like is my true nature just by being around them. And so that also feels very 
satisfying and peaceful and allows me to move through moments of turmoil and woundedness and chaos with more grace. Cause then I can find the place where, okay, this is my true nature or how I want to show up in this moment that feels true and authentic to me because of having those experiences of being with the trees. And then another thing I wanted to talk about is um, like the, I have a passage, like a quote from the book. Oh yeah. About, yeah. I'm going to read it. It is about yeah. communicating, oh, communicating without speaking. You've seen someone walk into a room whose regal presence was immediately felt by you or the person who owns the stage. You do not need to speak or be imposing physically to communicate and create a presence. How does the body hold that amount of energy? How does the presence fill the space around the body and beyond the body? The connection to community and your divine purpose create the radiating effect that we speak of. A tree is born in the community and only knows how to live in and with its natural and divine purpose. We are willing to welcome you with open arms into our community. Let yourself tap in and connect with us. Whatever you can remember and reclaim your own sense of community, connection, and your natural divine purpose. I love this. <laughs> because <laughs> I love that too. Thank you <laughs> for reading yeah. it. Yeah, because I think it's also related to what we were talking about in the in the beginning. Or oh, in my case, for example, like I, I felt that wound of uh, not feeling part of the group or not feeling part of the community somehow. And today, when I was with mm-hmm. the trees, you have you have that exercise of uh, connecting with the roots of the trees and feeling mm-hmm. like your roots also like are part of that connection, that community, right? And yes. that feeling of belonging. And I feel that can also help us to carry that frequency of belonging elsewhere, right? wherever we go. Yes. That feeling of being part of that community as well. Because it's super yes. important. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I think you're right. And I, I too have felt times where I didn't have the community and didn't feel the belonging. And I also know, like you said, with the paradigm shifting, as mm-hmm. as you or I or someone else, as you're growing, sometimes your community's changing or you're changing enough. So knowing that there's this, place where you feel that you have belonging is very reassuring throughout all of the changes. And as the paradigm is shifting, it's a nice constant security to go back to. Yeah. It, it brings you home. And then mm-hmm. also like, uh, I love the idea of communicating without speaking because that's what the tree do. Right. And, mm-hmm. and how humans, we sometimes think that we have to say all these words or we have to do something to stand out. And sometimes it's just your frequency, your energy that is going to do that for you when you mm-hmm. are aligned with that. Right. Yes. So yes. How, how can we bring that sense of community into our life, but communicate more without words? Mm, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about earlier when I said you walk into a room and you notice someone. I try when I can to let myself follow that feeling. And even if I think, oh, this person doesn't know me. What if I approach them and say, hello, how are they going to respond? I I try not to let myself worry about what someone is going to think and more to follow that connection. If I feel, oh, I like this person's presence. I want to be around them. And I know for me, as much as I cultivate this connection and sense of community with the trees and all the plants in my yard, I also need people to feel happy. And so it's, some of it is a a acknowledgement of if I, I feel like I'm still building community where I am finding, finding the ways for me of if something isn't already naturally happening in my life, but I feel a need or a desire for that community to acknowledge that my desire for that, my need for that is valid. And what are the actions I'm going to take to make that happen? And one of the things that the trees that I love about them that reminds me is 
I still at times will feel like I'm the weird one in the room. And, (laughs) and yet I remember these trees, they don't, they don't seem to worry about how others perceive them. They just are who they are and, and that's good enough. And so that's one of the things that I try to carry with me in most all of my interactions with people. And then I feel like it makes me, the people who connect with me, they probably are my community. And the people who think I'm the weird one, but not in a way that they <laughs> like, well, you know, they're just, they're just not my kind of people. And um, yeah. it's funny, when I was in grad school, there was a day that I went to help out some biology students, they were doing field research. I don't exactly know what kind, but I was helping them. And uh, at one point, the ways that I could help them were done. And so I was sitting on a blanket with my journal in in the woods, and they were finishing up their research and coming back. And a caterpillar came or fell on me. I don't know. So I'm sitting there talking to the caterpillar. And I actually was talking out loud because even though I said I don't know ways, I do I do a lot to the little creatures. So I'm talking to the caterpillar and and to the people come back and they were like, what are you doing? And they said it in that tone of voice. And I I said, I'm talking to the caterpillar. And <laughs> and they looked at me and they're like, why? And they just, they did not understand this at all. And in my mind, I'm thinking, these people are biologists. They love nature. And, and yet for me, talking to a caterpillar, they did not understand that at all. And, and again, I didn't feel like the caterpillar was going to talk back to me. I'm not saying that every <laughs> single animal like has a message for me or always talks to me, but I just, I was kind of confused. And I thought, I don't get why this is so weird for them. Like to me, they were acting like I was some weirdo freak and they have never seen anyone do that. And why would anyone do that? And then about two weeks or a month after that, I was at another grad school event where there was a community garden that they also taught kids how to grow gardens and working with plants and all that. So I was there and there was this sunflower that had so big, really big sunflowers when their head is so many inches across, like eight to 12 inches or bigger than our head. A lot of times it gets so heavy because this, when the seeds develop, it's hard for the sunflower to hold the face towards the sun. So it droops. And to me, it always looks like it's somebody hanging their head down. Mm -hmm. So I went over to this tall sunflower and I was patting it and I said, it's okay, sunflower. You don't have to be sad. (laughs) And I was just being silly because, you know, I was just having fun. And then one of the gardeners walked by and they said something like, Oh, don't be sad sunflower. (laughs) And, and I was like, Oh, yeah, these are my people. Like they talk to the plants they too. Do. And they don't, they're not like, why are you talking to that sunflower? Is everything okay with you? Do you need yeah. to go see someone if you're, you know, is your mental c- capability okay? And so in terms of community, I don't know if this is exactly the answer you wanted, but I just feel that, you know, there's people who might never understand you. And then there are other people who immediately they understand you. And right it's nice to remember that even if you don't have a lot of examples right now in your life or people who you feel that community with, if you're alive, there's somebody that you can have that with. There's some being. And so I think keep on leaning into that and believing that, and maybe the trees will help you out. Maybe you can ask the trees, Hey, I need some more people, friends, help me out with this. (laughs) Tell me where to go. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. So make space for you. In, like, yes, in terms of space. practicality right in your calendar and so on and mm-hmm. also like embrace who you are and mm-hmm. and if someone is not receiving you there's someone else who will so yes yeah. well like i said some of this for yeah. me is still even though i channeled this book and another question that i had is how can we embody the queen or the king in us because that's mm-hmm. another thing that the trees talk about well a little bit i touched upon it related to community, but I think it goes back to this thing about your true nature and some people, the way in which they might be the stereotypical archetypal queen or king that commands a room and speaks proclamations and, and loves all the things that go along with it in terms of stereotypes. And then 
there might be a type of person who they're just living every day from their true nature, from their heart, and they are believing in themselves and, and living their truth. To me, I think that is being your own king or queen of your life. It doesn't have to mean that you're some extroverted, royal, rich person. Maybe that is who you are. But I I find when I do readings for people, it's always very clear to me the things that are what we might call ego and the things that are not the things that are really your, your inclination from your soul for how it wants to manifest in this lifetime or what your soul's purpose is or what your blueprint is maybe. So when, when I've seen this distinction, what it makes me think about is that there is a, a nature, a true nature that you have that is like your clearest alignment or your best version of you being yourself from your soul in this moment and moving forward. And so being the king or the queen is returning to that. It's it's letting yourself be who you actually are to the full extent of that ability and not letting yourself wonder if you're too much or if you're too weird or or concerning yourself too much with what others think because your own soul's expression is that truest form of you coming forth and again being with the trees i find helps to calibrate you or allow you to integrate and and connect to that level of being around these these wise trees who they are being their best regal and royal self and you know, there's a pine tree and there's a maple tree and an oak tree and a sycamore and an apple tree. And they're all very different, but they're all living to their fullest expression of their tree selves. And and that's how I think of it. So to me, being the king or the queen is really about living to your true nature and and not letting other people's ideas about who you are or judgment about who you are impact and influence that I love that <laughs> yeah yeah so would you like to share a little bit about the process that you are helping people with their books yes yes so okay. first I want to say I off and on have been writing I said I've journaled a lot for many years yeah. and from early in my childhood I thought about being a writer and or an artist and and at various points in my life I knew I wanted to write a book and I even tried, <laughs> I wrote a novel, but I didn't continue pursuing it. But when I did this book, I decided I'm going to make this happen finally, because it felt to me that I had this dream that was, I was almost always putting it off or not giving it the time because it felt like too big of a thing. Even this novel that I wrote that has 80,000 words starting that felt so challenging because if uh, in my mind, I just thought, oh, novels have anywhere from 70,000 to 150,000 words. That's so many words. How will I ever begin? And the, the monumental massiveness of it always kept me from mm -hmm. getting that far. And even when I did start, there, there's a lot of little pieces to it, but what I know and, and what I'm helping people with now is when you make a regular commitment to whatever it is, your creative craft, I'm just going to talk about writing since that's the theme for here, but you can apply it to something else. If you love something else more, right. Having your writing ritual. So for me, I light some incense. I have a playlist that I like less for this than for some of my other writing. Although sometimes I did it this one because I was channeling it. I didn't want my playlist because there's songs that have various music. So I would meditate and then channel it. But, and that right there for each piece of writing that I work on, I have a little bit of a different process that meets the needs of what I need to bring that book forth. And uh, I have another fiction book that I'm getting ready to work on. One, one of the things I know is that doing it alone can be very challenging. So mm -hmm. I joined a course last year that helped me get some momentum. And, and then when the course was over, I connected with 
a person to do accountability, to keep me going with the book. And so what I'm supporting people with is having that accountability and either in a group setting, or if people want to work with me one-on-one to figure out their, what is your writing ritual? How are you going to get yourself to do it? And sometimes it feels that people have to almost force themselves to do it, but a lot of habits Uh, until you know, how is it going to work for you? What is going to work for you? There's a process of experimentation. And it's also until it's a habit, until it's a part of who you are, part of your identity, there's a lot of emotional and scheduling things that can get in the way of it happening. And yet when you're working with someone like me, I'm there to help you is it an emotional thing blocking you? Is it a mental thing? I've had clients where we just strategized, okay, how, how are you going to hold yourself accountable when I'm not here on the call with you? (laughs) And so, and I've used some of various tools that I help people with of, well, here's what you could do. Could you daily track and have a daily word count? Could you have a daily check-in with somebody where you're telling them what your word count was? Is Mm -hmm. it, um, there's different things that work for different people. So some of it is just finding what method works for you, but knowing that similar to, to other things in life, like every day, you're not going to feel like writing, even if that is your commitment. But if your daily habit is to write every day, then you write whether or not you feel inspired Mm -hmm. and, and not that that's the only way to do it because I even now don't write every day. I mean, in one way or another, I probably am because I have a lot of little post-it notes and index cards where I'll write <laughs> ideas. And and so making making your habit of it, making for some it's a ritual. Like I said, I like to light incense. I like to have music going. I like to have a drink that I like nearby to create, oh, I've set up all the things and now I set the timer or I turn on my playlist and I go. And it also having that habit makes it so that after a period of time suddenly you have a word count that's that's impressive that you can work with because i've met many people who and even myself you've got the idea but until you start getting it on the page it's still just an idea and it you you need to bring it to life you need to give it the time to to support it. And also there's a lot of work that I did with myself, sometimes with a coach, sometimes in my journal, sometimes in meditation of how do I push through the fears of what if it's bad? What if nobody likes it? I can't do this. There inevitably, I I think for almost all of us, fears come up when you're doing something new that having either a one-to-one coach or in a program, having someone help you move through that because otherwise the fears can stop you. There was one point I was maybe two thirds of the way through writing this book. And and look, we said it's a short book or maybe I was almost done. Maybe I only had two chapters to go and a few little odds and ends. And, and, And three weeks went by where I was not working on the book even though it was in my calendar every day, I had a timer on my phone every day that would go off and say time to work on the book. And I was not doing it. And I thought, what is going on? So I met with a coach and she and I, like we worked through it. And I had a lot of fears that we dug into and, and we made a plan and then I started working on it and then I could get back to writing. But some of it, it wasn't the lack of ideas keeping me from it. It wasn't the discipline of doing it. It wasn't knowing the value of, oh, this will be good once it's done. Well, and when I say good, I mean, good that it's done. Other people can judge whether they think it's good (laughs) or not. I mean, we both like it, but y'all can read it yourself and see what you think. But there was the, I had to push through and work through my own fears and insecurities. And what are the things keeping me from this? And, And yet there's a value in moving through the difficult things and coming out on the other side and having gone through that. And, and I feel, I know myself more now and it's not so daunting to think, okay, I'm going to write another book. Like I haven't set my deadline yet for when I'm going to finish. That's, 
that's kind of where I am right now. I was thinking, okay, what is the book and what timeline am I giving myself? But I'm already starting to think of that because I know, okay, all right, it's time to get back in there and, and start working on that next piece. And I'm also excited to do that. But some of the benefits of working on the first one and working with someone one-on-one to, to uncover what were the things holding me back? What were the fears that were stopping me? And, and that's something that I'm excited to support other people with too, because it's Mm -hmm. a lot of the great things that we want to do. Oftentimes the reason we're not doing them there there's the logistics of the habits. And then there's also the fears and how we feel about ourselves and how you feel about what's going to happen and all the unknowns that go into that and having someone walking along with you who has done it and also worked through her own fears is, is such a benefit. Yeah. It changes everything. Mm -hmm. And so one last question, time capsule. If you could send a message to your younger self, maybe Ooh. when you <laughs> were starting this um, like psychic journey, or mm-hmm. maybe when, or, or maybe even when you were before starting the book, like what would you tell yourself? Mm, that's a good question. Mm. You know, I would have told myself that. Well, two things. First, I think, even though I talked to the trees, there weren't a lot of times when I was writing this, when I asked the trees for advice, (laughs) do you know what I like? It's almost like I was writing the book, but I wasn't even using my own, like I wasn't taking walks and just being receptive. I wasn't. And, and some of that was, I was talking to other people and, and also maybe I was in my head enough about it that I was scared to spend more time waiting to hear what the trees might say, but I I think that I would tell myself too that if I would have let some of the things that were actually in the book help me get through the book, it would have been an easier process for me. And so it's almost, I I don't know. It it almost makes me think it'd be like if a yoga teacher was writing a yoga book, but then they stopped (laughs) practicing yoga as much when they were writing it. That's kind of how it felt. And, Mm -hmm. and now I almost feel like I'm reaching a full circle moment of there was something bothering me last week and I went and just spent time outside till I felt better. And then yesterday I was having a difficult moment and I'm like, okay, pick up, pick up the book, (laughs) look at the book. And so it's just remembering for the listeners of any, any tool maybe that you have that you've used finding ways to remind yourself when you're going through another difficult time, see if that tool works for this situation again. Yeah. Yeah. Or in another way, maybe. Yes, exactly. Awesome. That's a great advice. Okay. And yeah, anything else that you you would like to to add? um, Also how people can contact Mm, you and so on. Yes. Oh, and I guess I should have said the other thing I think I would have told my younger self, because I said there were two things. I think I would have just given her a hug and said, you're doing great. Just keep on doing this. And it's okay to start scared and nervous. Um, So, so there's that. And that's for everyone else too. listening of you're doing the best that you can. I know that you are. And that's, that's wonderful. And I want to always encourage that it's, it's okay to go at your own pace and not that's the other thing from the trees that I love, which I don't know if it's as much in this book as I always feel when they're talking to me is this information of, I don't have to, even if in my mind, I want things to happen more quickly. And I have these goals and these desires, life is going to unfold in its own timing. And I can work with that, but I can't necessarily speed up processes that are outside of my control. So just encouraging everyone listening to definitely check out the book. You can read the first two or three chapters for free online. And if, if, and when you get the book, I definitely want to hear what your experiences are of talk to the trees, because this second book, I'm going to be as excited to read it as the first, because I don't even know what's going to be in it yet, other than a few juicy things. And, uh, and I would love if you're listening and thinking you would like to write a book, 
whether or not it's a book, maybe it starts out as a blog. Maybe you just know, I have things to say. I want to be saying them more often. I would love to support anyone with that. And, and yeah, either in a one-to-one or I, I have a group that's in the process of forming right now. So by the time this goes live, it may be formed, but I, I still work one-to-one with people and you can find me at either rachelstravelli.com or soulpioneer.com. And I'm on most of the social media places at Rachel Stravelli. Perfect. <laughs> well, I encourage everyone to read Talk to the Trees. I, I love it. And it's helped me so much. So I hope it helps so many more people. And thank you so much, Rachel. It's been a pleasure. I love mm-hmm. the conversation. And oh, thank so happy you, to have Esther. You. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>